Thank you. You fill out, uh, you just fill it up again. The, um, the water level must be there. They must have water at all times. If they get dry, even for a short length of time, they will die. Uh, Deces were named after a um, Scandinavian uh, queen. And Deces are kind of like that. They want things their way. And if, if they don't get it, bad things happen. And the, um, the water, when you water them, be, be sure that the water you're using not only is pure, but clean. So you're gonna have to change the water in your trays every, every month or so just to get the, the um, impurities out. Some people um, also grow them using flow tables where they try to simulate the flow of water over the roots. And it's a little more complicated that way, but it will work. I've never tried it, but a lot of people do. Um, some people have actually grown them just in buckets of pure water and they will, they will survive quite comfortably. They, sometimes they've been flooded in nature, so they're not going to be bothered by it. The next thing we have to worry about is food. Now, the, the environment that these is living is an area where the water has leached out all of the nutrients in the soil. Or, so there is very little food in the soil. So you, if you use the uh, standard uh, fertilizer protocols that you use for most of your orchids, you're gonna kill these things because they cannot tolerate a large amount of food. So what is best and what I do is, I, uh, I use my fertilizer about quarter strength, just a regular balanced fertilizer. And I take the plants out of their trays and I pour the fertilizer onto the, uh, onto the mix, let it drain through. And generally speaking, if I have time, I'll water it with, wash it through after about 20 minutes with uh, you know, plain water. And then it gives me time to clean the tray and then I'll put them back in their trays. And that way they get the food passing through, but they, it doesn't sit on their roots, which will kill them because their roots cannot handle strong fertilizer. Um, some, uh, uh, the other thing you have to worry about with thesis is light. Thesis, generally speaking, will, will like a bright indirect light, many as, our, as many of our other orchids, but also take direct sunlight. There is one caveat though, their roots cannot get too hot. If their roots get over 70 degrees, they will die. And, orca, and, and it's, it's not that difficult to keep it that cool because they're sitting in water to begin with. But if you, um, you, ha if you happen to be in a location where the sun does beat on them for a long period of time, it gets that tray warm, you're gonna have problems. So try to keep the uh, roots from getting over about 70 degrees or so. Now the plants are very tolerant of different temperatures. So it's kind of a, of a, of a difficult thing because they will take temperatures down to, to freezing. I'll take a light frost for a while. They can go up to about 80, 85 degrees without any problems at all, as long as the roots stay cool. Now, last June, we went to Hawaii and the person who was watching my greenhouse for me didn't do too much and the temperature actually got up to 104 in there and they survived comfortably, but it was only probably for a short length of time. So be careful um, about, about getting the roots too warm. That's a very important part of it. Now they, they also live in a very damp environment. So they're going to have a lot of need of humidity. Humidity is very important with these things, maybe like 70% or so at least. And because you have humidity, you've got the flip side, you've got to have air movement. If you don't have air movement, fungal infections can occur. So make sure you have some fans running all the time, or if you're growing them out of sight, out of, out of doors, you probably have enough um, wind just because we live in a fairly windy environment here to keep them, keep them going uh, comfortably. <clears throat> okay, I, I talked a little bit about temperature. The other thing you have to worry about about these things is over the years, I have been serving as orchid doctor for the various uh, various orchid shows and various other things. And once in a while you get to talk to somebody about these. These are grows are kind of like a secret society. You have to say the secret password to get in, I guess. But I have found that talking with these people, I've learned the problems that uh, people who grow epiphytic orchids have and run into with or with the thesis, and that's why they get a bad reputation. And uh, the two things seem to show up the most. And the first thing is, is the fertilizer and the purity of the water. If you're watering, a lot of people use fertilizer injectors or they're watering and the water splashes around, even though they have them in their own tray separate, water's gonna splash 
and the fertilizer is going to get in there, and that's going to raise the the um, the uh, parts per million of uh, salts and and chlorine and so forth to the point where it'll kill the uh, kill the plant. The other one is um, using city water. You cannot use even even though San Francisco has great water, at least it did until they started make, putting well water in it. It's not safe to use. And the reason being is chloramine is in it as well as various minerals. And uh, the old days, the regular chlorine that they would use would clear out if you just let it stand for a day. But chloramine is meant to be a lot more stable and last a lot longer. So you can't use city water. And the third one, let's see here, is letting them dry out. Uh, you can't let these plants dry out, not even for a day. I gave one to a good friend of mine and they went away for a week and the person who was taking care of them didn't keep it wet and it was dead. These aren't the kind of orchids that go into a slow decline and you can bring them back. They're either alive or they're not. And the last one is repotting. You've got to repot pieces every year. After they finish flowering, the stems start to die off. You'll see the little uh, new shoots come out. And that is the time to repot them. And you have to repot them every year, whether they have bloomed or not. The mix breaks down way too quickly. And again, you'll have impurities that these pieces don't like, and they will die on you. Now, I wanted to show repotting here. And the reason I want to do that is because you can see when we take one of these things apart, just how different it is in the orchids that we normally grow. This is one that I, now normally I would have potted, repotted this a couple of months ago, but I knew I was doing this talk. So I, I let it uh, stay in its pot longer than I normally would want to. You can see here, these are the old, old leaves that have died off, almost died off because they've done their job. And there's a lot of new shoots. Normally I want those shoots to be just about an, an inch tall or so before I go into it. Now, let's see, let's get over here. Now you can see what we have here. What we have is a lot of little tubers and a plant which is growing very differently from, from what we normally have in our gardens. And it, it grows, if I can get all the small stuff. It grows a, a, let's do it this way. This one I've already taken apart, so it'll be a little bit easier. What we have when you finish is you have these tubers. And the tubers are the way, almost all orchids store food one way or another, and these plants store their food in tubers. The tubers are connected to the mother plant by stolons. And the stolon, okay, is right here. Not to, let's get the roots out of the way. You can see this is how they propagate themselves. They're like strawberries. They produce a stolon, and the stolon becomes a plant for next year. What you also will find in there, when you take it apart, is you'll find last year's tuber. It's all gone, and this is the former shoot. And so you just toss that out. And you'll find that it produces a lot. A lot of these things reproduce like rabbits. <laughs> this is this is one that's starting up. Here's another one. Now you can separate them and make any, put each one in a separate pot. A lot of people do that, but I have so many of them I don't anymore. This is when a stolen first sends out its, sends out its um, shoot, it will produce something that looks like this, just a tiny little plant. This doesn't even have its tuber yet. And that will grow and the tuber will, will start to swell up and then eventually it will start to form its inflorescence. And the way it does that is it starts out more or less as a rosette growing near the ground. Then all of a sudden the shoot will come straight up with a few leaves on it. And then from there you'll get your flowers. The flowers on, uh, on Deesa's, generally speaking, are, are one in a, they grow in a, in a long, chain it was individually separated usually fairly well the one problem we have with um, 
due to the uniflora is the fact that flowers sometimes tend to compress into one another and they don't look so nice. But for most of the others, the flowers stay nicely far apart. And you'll get a, 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 a inflorescence anywhere from 12 inches to about 30. Although this year, they grew rather extraordinarily well. We actually had uh, inflorescences that came up to 48 inches tall. Now, when you want to repot one of these, you remove all of the old dead stuff from last year. You don't want to leave that in the, in the pot because it's going to, going to rot. If, when you, since it's covered with a whole lot of sphagnum moss, what you can do, which I don't want to do here because it's even more messy than I already am, is you just kind of swish the thing around in a bucket full of rainwater and all the, and all the stuff will fall off. The mix that we use is just simple. It's a very simple mix. It's, it's uh, sphagnum moss mixed with perlite. So, uh, now one of our members has suggested using um, gorilla hair, which is uh, uh, redwood shred, shredded redwood bark. And I'm going to try that with these plants when I get later on when I repot them. Now, I use about, I like to say, about 20% sphagnum moss. You all know how they work with sphagnum moss? Anybody here not know how to, use, how to work with sphagnum moss? Yeah, I notice I'm wearing gloves. That's one of the most important things. Um, you can get a very nasty skin disease if you don't. It's sporocytosis, the, spor the little spores from the, the, um, that live along with the sphagnum moss get under your skin and turn your skin into jello. So it's always a good idea to wear gloves. Okay, so the stuff is made is fairly light and loose. You, you shred it apart when you when you get it out of the back of the bundle. Now, what I'll do is I'll take the plant that I have here. Now, this one, as you can see, is it has not yet reached the light. That's why it's white. So I'll put it a little lower and I'll put them in my hand. Oh, excuse me. I'll put them in my hand like this, and I'll take a big wad of the moss and I'll place the moss over one side of the group of plants or plants. I'll place them on the other side and I'll get a nice, well, you want, this sort of pads the thing. You don't want to, um, you don't want to bother the, um, the, the uh, bulbs and the roots too much. So by, um, Putting it in like this, then you take a pot. This is the pot it came out of. You just kind of work it into the pot. Add more moss. Now, at Longwood Gardens, they pack them in tighter than I do because they sent them a plant. They wondered how I did it so loose. But unlike growing epiphytic orchids, where we try to pot the um, plant very tightly so to simulate living on the side of a tree. With these plants, you want to put them in a larger pot than they really than it would look like they would need because those stolons have to have somewhere to go to produce the tubers. And so you don't want to make it, put it into too small of a pot. And you want don't want to pack, I don't like to pack the stuff down too tight because it makes it harder for the stolons to work their way around. And there you go, that's about it. And that plant will be ready to go. Now the little one that was left over, it came loose here. This guy, I would just take a small pot like this one and do the same thing, put a little moss in the bottom of the pot. Now this one probably will not flower next season. But these are rather quick. Even from seed, they will reach flowering size in three years, which is pretty good. And you just pack it in, push it down, make it happy, and there you go. It's quite a bit different from, from uh, growing traditional orchids, but it's not any, any really much more difficult. Um, some people use redwood bark. You can, some people will put um, charcoal in their mix to keep the, uh, the mix stable. Sphagnum moss is always really good though because it does have a little bit of the, it keeps the mix acidic and they like that. So um, if you want charcoal, by the way, the secret is go down to Lazari down off of um, 
Bayshore, south, just south of, of Geneva. They will sell you the right kind of charcoal for a whole lot less uh, money than you buy the horticultural stuff. And it's the same thing. Okay, and the pots. I tend to grow mine in, in, um, in uh, plastic pots. The, uh, the uh, uh, evergreen ones seem to prefer that, although the terrestrial ones seem to prefer clay pots. My favorite size, just uh, for general growing, it'd be like about a five inch azalea pot. And, and remember, don't cram them in, give them space. It's much better to overpot. This is a perfect orchid for people like to overpot and overwater. <laughs> okay. I spoke a little bit about when to repot. One, do it. And two, try to do it when the plant is. Uh, if any time your visa is looking bad for some reason, starting to look kind of peaked or whatever, one thing to do is to repot it because it's nine times out of 10, the problem is something in the mix. Okay, these things also have pests just like any other, any other plant. The ones that I seem to run into most are aphids. They tend to especially like the, um, the, the buds, I guess it's just like any other plant and also sometimes scale. Now, the problems with these is because they're so sensitive, they, you cannot use any of the oil-based uh, insecticides or any of the systemics. They will not tolerate that. What I've used um, is less something like uh, Bay, uh, Bayer's uh, three-in-one insecticidal soap, or I mean, Safer's, excuse me, it's insecticidal soap. And you spray that on, and what I'll often do, is I kind of hold the plant this way and spray it. So most of it kind of drains down away from, away from the uh, plant rather than getting down into the roots. It seems to work pretty well. The other thing I've used in my greenhouse, and I, and I do have to grow most of them in the greenhouse because the creatures like to dig them up when they're in my backyard, is um, uh, more like biological methods. Um, things like the um, a phytus wasp for um, scale and uh, lace wings for just about everything and uh, ladybugs. And the way to do it with ladybugs, if you have a greenhouse, is don't release them all at the same day. Release them in successive days for three or four or five days. And then you'll get a much more successful uh, use of them. Okay, now. Okay, the other problem that, um, that people have with them sometimes are thrips and spider mites. And generally speaking, thrips and spider mites are the result of the, of the um, climate in the greenhouse or the, wherever you're growing them, it's a bit too dry. If you can increase the humidity, which you usually don't do with these, but the higher humidity will, will prevent your problems with spider mites and with thrips. Um, sometimes uh, slugs will want to eat these things or snails. Now you can't put the, the um, the, uh, the, the meal on the plants, what you do is just put it around the trays. And believe it or not, they will attract them out of the, out of the, pot, out of the plants and they will go down and eat it. I use sluggo. Um, it works, seems to work pretty well. Metaldehyde, unless you use about 7%, is actually rather useless because this, the lower percentage ones that they sell in the stores kill off the, the weak snails. And so you see the snail shells there and you think it's working, but um, the, the healthy snails or the, or the younger ones, whatever, continue. And so you have to buy more of it and it makes the, the company really happy. So unless you can get metaldehyde at 7%, it's not worth the trouble. Okay, the other thing you're gonna have some, is trouble with with these plants is finding them. <laughs> there aren't a lot of, places that do sell them. They, they have sort of a bad reputation in the orchid world as being hard to grow. So not a lot of people grow them to sell because they're not gonna make a lot of money. But um, there's a guy here in San Francisco who sells on eBay under the eBay name of Uniflora. I don't know who he is, but he seems to have a number of them available. If you uh, go, on, uh, go on the internet, there is a uh, Facebook page devoted to growing pieces and there are people there who have them for sale. I brought a lot of them so that everybody can, who wants one here, if they buy a raffle ticket, will probably win one. That will get you started. 
the species that I, or the, excuse me, the um, plant that I brought is, um, <coughs> excuse me, Visa vicii. Now, Visa vicii is a primary hybrid. It's a hybrid of probably the most popular one, which is Visa uniflora. And it's crossed with Visa racemosa, which is one which is a little more difficult to grow. But it produced a, a much nicer plant in many ways. For one thing, the flowers are much more evenly spaced on the racine. The second thing is, is uh, uniflora does not tend to produce a lot of stolons, so they're, they're, they're slower to, um, to uh, propagate, whereas, uh, ras whereas racemosa produces a lot of stolons. The bad thing about racemosa is it is a, uh, a dormant type, and it's also only flowers after a fire. There are a lot of plants that do that. They want a fire to burn, to burn off all of the high vegetation and the veldt so that uh, their seeds will have a chance to, um, to sprout and without a lot of competition from taller plants taking up all the sunlight. So, you know, unless you want to start, you know, working very hard with Visa racemosa, it's not a good one to grow, but it does not, if, if, if it's properly crossed, it does not uh, put that on to its, to its hybrid. And so therefore this, this one has all of the advantages of, um, of both uh, species and a, lot of, and a lot of disadvantages removed. Um, let's see what else about it. I, I know it's a, uh, it's a hybrid and I know many people in this, uh, in this society prefer to grow uh, species, and I've got no quarrel with that, but if you're starting a whole new genus, it's very different. Let's start out with um, a simpler one, because a simpler one to grow, because once you get these going well, then you can graduate to the, uh, the more complex kinds. Um, if you do have trouble with them, I'm more than happy to have you contact me. My uh, email and phone number, everything are in the society roster, and you can call me and I'll try to help you as best as I can. Um, let's see what else. Right with. Okay, I did bring a number of plants, about 23 of them, I think, today for the plant raffle today. So I hope everybody who wants one and who's heard this talk will want to take one home. And I hope there's enough there. This is my gift to the Orchid Society. I'm, I'm, I'm not paid for my talk or for the plants. This is my gift to you people because I want to share the love and enthusiasm that I do have for these plants. And um, yes, also, by the way, if you're looking at uh, DC, Disa vicii, you may sometimes see it listed as, as uh, Disa viciana. And the reason for that is the rules of botanical nomenclature uh, have changed to where uh, man-made hybrids cannot use Latin epithets. So they changed the name a little bit. So if you see under that name, it's the same plant. And I guess that's about all we have to do. I hope that uh, this has been helpful to you. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to address them at this time. So the plants you say always have to have water, but you brought your plants for the... So do we need to get them home and put them in water immediately? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're okay for the, for the couple of hours. That, you know, since I, I took them out of the trays uh, this afternoon. But uh, do keep them wet. And they're very unforgiving on that, yes? Could you talk about the flower structure? Oh yeah, the flower structure is very interesting. Most orchids, the petals are the interesting part, but this is the, the sepals. Uh, it's beautiful and, 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 and inspiring on them. The, the um, petals are two very little tiny things that barely cover the column. And the lip is just a little that uh, sits between the two dorsal sepals. They are different in that way. They, they always produce, um, in a, in a, if, they're, if they're growing properly, they'll produce sort of a triangular shaped uh, plant or flower, excuse me. And they're, um, they're very, very uh, different in that, not only are, they only, are the sepals the, the prominent part, but the, 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 their shape, you know, the, the front, you know, the um, dorsal sepals always kind of hooded and sometimes pointed. That's what probably made them fascinating for me. They all have bright colors. The colors are very variable, but even within species, they'll go from 
red to yellow to orange for salmon. And they're, and the shape is very strange. Uh, anything else you want to know about the flowers? Uh, okay, and another question. Yeah. Oh, Lazari. Uh, when I was working for white oak orchids, we used to go to the Lazari. But if you go down, um, it, it, there's an intersection of Geneva and Bayshore, right by the county line here in San Francisco. And if you continue down Bayshore, uh, south of the Geneva Avenue turnoff, if you go, I guess it's like one long block, you come to another signal, you turn left, turn, and then there's a driveway immediately to the left. It looks like it's just a dirt road going nowhere. Go on that, uh, on that road, and you'll come up to a building that looks like a ruin. Um, it's the old SP, uh, SP repair shops. And located there is Lazari Charcoal Company. And they sell all kinds of charcoal. And they'll sell the kind of charcoal you want, which is you know, granulated or little round things about the size of a, of a pea or, or so. You don't want to be chopping up your, your briquettes, but they, they sell all kinds of uh, charcoal. They sell mesquite charcoal. They sell uh, blacksmith charcoal. They sell fireplace charcoal. And just tell them you want the granulated charcoal. They'll sell you a nice bag of it. It's not that expensive and it'll last you probably the rest of your life. If you, hmm? yeah, if you, if you want good perlite, you can always go down to um, Romeo down on, um, down in what's, uh, Princeton by the sea, sort of a suburb of, um, of uh, Half Moon Bay. And uh, they will sell you these nice big sacks of good perlite. The perlite that you buy in the, in the garden stores is more like the stuff they sweep off the floor of the factory. What you want is, the, is stuff that's a little bit more uniform and a little bit bigger. The use of perlite is one reason is to keep the mix from packing down. So you need some good size stuff to have it work right. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, 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 Romeo is located in Princeton by the sea. It's just at the north end of Half Moon Bay. Pardon? Oh. Yeah, it's an interesting um, all uh, so Bay is handing Santa Fe over there. Well, <laughs> he's handing out uh, so everyone gets uh, a raffle ticket for the first time for the conference. He told us, he said, some of the Vietnam college is just why he named faster. Yeah, VTI is this one right here. The pink one. That's the only picture I took. These other pictures, well, not the not the one of me, but the others were taken by, by Ron Parsons, who was kind enough to lend me his pictures for this talk. He's a much better photographer than I am. Thank you, Paul. You're welcome. Uh, people can, can you hear me or okay so we're transitioning for a minute um bill there was an awarded plant from the judges next door he's going to show that real quick uh here in the room the judges made one award um tonight Okay. Yeah, sure, I can wait for forever. I mean, we've been here since here. I just don't want to get yelled at for being a slob, which is what I normally call. Sorry, we're doing a little bit of uh, technical. Thank you very much. Uh, the projector yeah. light. Yeah. One other words. Me. Uh, one, you know, I got so uh, the projector light. There we are. Oh, Isn't that nice? Right here. Okay. So this was. I don't know if you had me or read the. Hey, Paul, you're still on. Sorry. Uh, this is going to be. I love the name. Procatovola key lime star. Um, uh, varietal name is Tanya Lamb. Uh, it is. Catley Chia Lime Sherbet by Brasavola Nodosa. Um, I brought this up for Tanya 
it got an HCC of 77 points. And I saw Tanya was on here, so she just found that out herself. And interestingly enough, on the way up here, it really started to smell. It got the nodosa going for it. So nice scent, lovely green flower. Uh, and when it was dark, it really started to smell. Okay, and that's the only one for tonight. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. All right. So should we start? Um, the, we're going to start show and tell here in the room real quick, and then we'll go to the one online. Um, there's also um, a gift exchange for those that brought gifts. Uh, there's a growing pool over there for the white elephant. And there's plenty of uh, things on the raffle table still. So, Bill, should we do the show and tell in the room? All right. So I don't know if people can see us. Ah, tech. So this one was brought in by Jeff with the G Harris. Uh, Catlia Schroederay. It's one of those things you have to come up and check out the lip. Um, I'm going to cheat here. Hold on. Didn't notice any scent, but I checked. Um, and that's another one of those really nice ones. Let's see here. You love Catley as Schroederay is. If you love Catley as Schroederay is awesome. Okay, Jeff with the G also brings Catlia coccinia. And if you've ever grown any little tiny red or orange, uh, often blooming little tiny ones, this is usually in the background. Primarily because if you see those big petals there, it gives those big flat petals to its progeny, which is really cool. Whee! Yeah, that's. That's about you know an inch and a quarter in diameter, but uh, the uh, offspring tend to be even bigger. And Jeff with the G brings in Frag Bessier. And this is another one of those plants that you will see. This is the parent of a whole lot of plants now. Well, when before Bessier was you know brought into cultivation, frags all kind of looked the same. They were all very spidery and that kind of thing. And then Bessier came in and we started getting color, big white petals and all this nifty stuff. So thank you to Bessier. And let's see, and let's see, I brought in this one, reaching as far as I can. Um, this one is Lelia Anseps um, Linearis. Uh, Linearis called that because of the funky stripiness of the ah, petals. Balancing act, trying to do both. Can't walk and chew gum. Well, what it, it tends to bloom, what I like about Anseps is it gets all ready to go and all the spikes are kind of ready. And then it tends to blast out all the flowers all at once. So you get one bowl full of all these spikes, it shoots its wad and it's over but it makes a heck of a specimen plant. I mean, if you notice, most of these are either open or very close to opening or eaten off by the snails. Uh, but I found, this, I found the snail and he went to his little snail maker today. Okay, Florence brings in Cymbidium Super Freak, which is Golden Elf by Tracy Annum. And I'll bet you, it's like working in a mirror. But let me try something here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It has that Tracy Annum scent. So sneak your mask off and give it a sniff because, oh, my goodness, it's lovely. I love any of the Tracy Annum hybrids. You tend to get this brown striping in them, you know, yellows and browns and spots and stripes. And in the first generations, you tend to get the scent. Next generations, it tends to get lost. So 
If you find the brown ones, you're probably going to get a good scent. Ah, gift exchange. So you're going to wish you brought one. That one. Florence. Cymbidium Dolly by Canran. Oh, really? And how's this very, oh, variety album? So it's Dolly by one of those, those Gensoa, often called Chinese Cymbidiums, little skinny ones. Those tend to have like one or two flowers, maybe on a spike. Um, I'm not familiar with Dolly, but it produced a nice little yellow flower. And a little, a little, a little bit of scent. The, the biggest scent I've seen on any of these is uh, on Sinense. And we've had many discussions on why some people can smell the Sinense scent and some people can't. And it's like, well, if you like rotten bananas and you like that, then you can smell it. And it's been entertaining, but uh, that's our table. Oh, and for everybody who brought a plant, who brought a plant for show and tell, don't forget to put one little yellow thing in here with your name on it. So if you brought one plant or hundred plants, you put one of those yellow things in. No, no, it's the yellow thing like this, this part. If you brought a plant in for the show and tell table for this one, right, which one, which show and tell was yours? Yeah, this is, yeah, this is show and tell. So if you brought a show and tell in, make sure you put one of these in here with your name on it. Because when we do the raffle, you get one. Why is that good? Because I won one last month. That's it. Well, I think we're ready for Lynn. Lynn, are you ready? I think I'm ready. Okay, I'm clicking share screen. Can I share now, Jeff? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The other thing while she's getting this up, John Rushworth, who does our ads and website and everything, uh, suggested folks submit their Instagram uh, handles. If you submit pictures to show and tell, uh, especially on Zoom, because we're going to be using them on social media to promote the society and to show off your stuff on Facebook and Instagram. So if you're up for that, uh, submit your Instagram handle and we'll start collecting those. Okay, Lynn, go ahead. Okay, I'm really close. How's that look? I can't get my notes yet. Okay, what do you see? Your title. Okay, you do not see my notes yet, right? Right. Perfect. Okay, here we go. So uh, let me move this over out of the way. So we have another gorgeous show and tell, virtual show and tell tonight. Uh, we have 55 beautiful orchid photos from 20 contributors, including a couple of new contributors. I really appreciate your taking the time to photograph and send them to me. So let's get started. The order in which they're shown is the order in which I receive them. So we're going to start out with uh, mea culpa. Seth Thomas sent this to me on October 31st for last month's show and tell, and I completely missed it. So my apologies to Seth. This is Elsie Luke Tone, which somebody left on the sidewalk for him a few years ago. It was nearly dead. Seth has done a great job bringing it back to its full glory. This is a complex hybrid, as you can see. It came out of Thailand in 1986 and has received six AOS awards to date because of the complex background, Luke Tone has produced several different color forms from deep wine red to this jewel tone gold with a dramatic burgundy lip and freckles too. Seth is growing it mounted beautifully. I hope you'll show us more of your orchids, Seth. And I again, apologize for missing it last month. Andrea Lodate, who just had knee surgery. Hope you're feeling better. This is her orchid uh, Potanara Higher Multiplier crossed with Potanara Jersey Summer. This helped to keep a smile on her face during the painful recovery from her operation. This is a hybrid made by Fred Clark of Sunset Valley Orchids in Vista, California, Southern California. He has not yet registered it. These complex Catalea hybrids are great windowsill growers and Sunset Valley Orchids website has hundreds of beauties to choose from. 
They would also make great holiday gifts. So Andrea, I hope you're feeling better and everybody happy shopping. Tom Pickford shows us his wrinkle Lelio Catlea or RLC Nakuchi. I can never remember the name. So when I talk to him, I always call it Hoochie Coochie and that makes him a little miffed. But the hybrid was registered by Armacost in Carpinteria, California in 1952. And this clone Mission Valley was given an award of merit in Oakland in 1957 to Ray and Ruby Alberts, in case anybody remembers them. So this is one of those fabulous old timey corsage orchids. It has full strong flower segments, which are not floppy. The flower is long lasted, long lasting. Tom said this blooming for three or four weeks with nine enormous flowers and it is fragrant. This is Tom's cat Leia Marjorie Hauserman, York. This is another classic corsage orchid registered in 1964 with beautiful form and just a great frilly lip. The hybridizer Hauserman of Illinois received the first AOS award on it in 1966 and named the clone York. Tom Pickford received the second AOS award on this same clone in 2014 uh, with four six inch flowers and it blooms reliable form every year. This has seven flowers right now and it's, it's a wow. And a more diminutive, but no less lovely Catlea Sierra doll. This is a hybrid made by Alan Koch of Gold Country Orchids in 1966. It has exceptionally round flat flowers and very round petals. It has received 21 AOS awards over the years. The most recent was to Japheth Co of F F SFOS in 2019, when it had two flowers, each about three and a half inches across. And the photo doesn't show it, but it has very crystalline texture, which makes it just sparkly. Gold Country has a lot of these small Catlea hybrids available for sale, and they're great additions to any collection. He especially breeds with the windowsill grower in mind, so check it out. Dale Martin always sends eight or nine great orchids, and he gives me the impossible job of choosing just three of them. This is his Cat Lady, Catlea Lady Lala Ultima. This is a very complex hybrid. As you can see, it was registered by Raymond Burr of Sea God Orchids and also of Perry Mason in 1976. The only award on it was to our friend Fred Schull in 2004 with four 19 centimeter, seven or seven and a half inch flowers. I'm still looking for one that Raymond Burr named Della Street, but I haven't found it. Dale has a beautiful blooming of it here. Nice job, Dale. This is Dale's Catlea Penny Pink Valencia another Raymond Burr cross out of Sea God Nursery. This one does not have as complicated a family tree. We can see that the Catlea bicolor narrowed the segments to create a more starry shaped flower. I'm guessing the clonal name Valencia is a reference to the color like a Valencia orange. These flowers are really nicely arranged on the inflorescence. This is Dale's Bulbophyllum tree frog. This is a new primary hybrid out of Carl, Carl Smith in Florida, it was just released last year and what cool flowers. Coral Smith has already received four awards of merit and two FCCs on it. This is a small plant, not as rambling as a lot of the bulbos, so it's a good candidate for windowsill growers. Dale has four blooms on his. I bought two of these from Coral Smith in 2020 and neither has bloomed yet, so I can't tell you if it's fragrant or stinky, but it has the characteristics of the Bulbophyllum hinged lip, which wiggles in the breeze to tantalize the pollinator and to help boost him inside for the, to do the deed. This is Dale's Paphiopetalum vexillarium. This is a primary hybrid, meaning it has just two species as its parents, and it was made back in 1870. I'm sure that this striking flower is the result of a lot of line breeding. We can see a lot of the characteristics characteristics of the ferianum parent and the dorsal sepala and the petals. This is just a charming little paphiopetalum with a wonderful glossy texture. <clears throat> Judy Carney shows us Dendromium igneonivium, the name meaning red and white dendrobium. This is a species endemic to Western Sumatra, found below 3000 feet. So it's an intermediate to, to warm grower. It has tall about 16 inch canes 
and the inflorescences arise from the nodes along the cane with three to five flowers each. Looks like Judy has a number of inflorescences with two inch crepey white flowers. It likes to be watered all year, no dry rest, but less water in the cool short days of winter. This is stunning, Judy. This is Judy's spectacularly grown seropetalum. It's now bulbophyllum, but it's in the seropetalum section of bulbophyllum. And the uh, species name is called Elizabeth Ann. This is a primary hybrid of two bulbo species, Longissimum and Rochildianum, both from Southeast Asia. It can be grown in a wide range of temperatures from warm to cool. So it's a good candidate for windowsill growers and it needs medium or filtered light. You can see that there are five to 10 flowers at the apex on, the, on these pendant inflorescences. And like many bulbos, it likes to ramble with rhizomes growing in all directions. The flowers are fragrant, not very long lasting, but what a show this is. Tyler Albrecht shows us a Pelorix cymbidium, which just put out a completely deformed spike. <clears throat> Pelorix flowers typically have petals, which try to become or look like lips but this one mutated itself beyond recognition. Tyler says this cymbidium has always produced, quote, normal pyloric flowers in the past. He thinks it might be a chemical interaction because it was a recent interaction, uh, infestation of scale and he used some pretty hardcore stuff and the spot where the cymbidium is got hit pretty hard, but no more scale. So that's a good thing. This is ugly. <laughs> this is Tyler's Dracula. Wallisii. It's a species from Colombia, found at elevations from 5,200 to over 9,000 feet. So that tells us it's a cool grower and it needs moist, humid conditions and lower light. Tyler's plant was awarded in HCC last May with a flower that was about <clears throat> four inches wide and five inches long, including those caudae or tails. The little face on this one is fabulous and the face is made up of two tiny petals, each about a quarter of an inch surrounding that dramatic uh, monkey lip. The sepals are covered with short yellow hairs. I don't know what their purpose is, but I will guess that it's to deter a predator of some sort. Bug, Tyler says this has been blooming for him for all year. <clears throat> this is Tyler's Oncostelle or Odontocidium, bittersweet. Is a hybrid of Oncidiums and Odontoglossums. Gives us this beautiful crimson lip and interesting splotches on the sepals and petals. Oncidiums are great windowsill plants, by the way, and should be available at the, at the Orchid Nursery or Trader Joe's near you. This little gem will appear at the end of tonight's show in the Show and Tell Pet Parade. <clears throat> Dave Hermeyer shows us Dendrobium Christi Dawn. We can see by Dave's hand at the top of the photo that this is a small plant and it's very floriferous. One of the great things about Dendrobiums is that they, unlike Cattleyas and many other genera, they often rebloom on canes that have previously bloomed. So you can get flowers on both old and new pseudobulbs, so more flowers on a plant. The flowers on Christi Dawn are more than two inches wide, so they're very large, large for the plant. And they're making a lovely display here for Dave. <clears throat> this is Dave's Laleo Cattleya, or it is now Cattleya, CG Roebling Sentinel. Dave, I'm sorry to clutter up your photo here, but this is kind of interesting. I found that there are two completely different primary hybrids given the name CG Roebling. One was made in 1895 that you see on the left here by Mr. Sanders and it is Gascaliana crossed with Purpurata. The other one was made in 1960, 1916 by Mr. Roebling himself, and it is Cattleya Hersoniana by Mendelii. Neither has an awarded clone that's named Sentinel, but I'm quite sure that the Roeblings we have in our collections around here are the earlier versions, Purpurata by Gascaliana. Lynn? Yeah. That's Ron. Um, so both those photos have purple rod in them. So they're so the one on the right's not correct for the photos for the species. It's got purple rod in it. So I don't know. Both those photos are of the 
hybrid on the left, but I, I, I hear what you're saying about the two hybrid names. Okay. So this is one of my fall favorites. It likes a wide range of temperatures and bright indirect light. It should do well outdoors in the Bay Area, protected from rain or on a windowsill. It's a great plant. This is Dave's beautifully grown Lelia Finkeniana, originally found as a naturally occurring hybrid of two Mexican species, Lelia albida by Lelia anseps. It has since been hybridized commercially with resulting color forms that range from white to purple and this lovely lavender pink with a white lip, I think is one of the best. It's a fairly compact plant with inflorescences up to two feet tall and two and a half to three inch flowers. Its parents suggest that it would do well outdoors in the Bay Area, protected from rain. And this is beautifully grown by Dave. Deborah Vale's Qualter shows us this floriferous Mastivalia. If anyone knows the name, please use chat to let Deborah know. Mastivalia is a new world genus of about 600 species found from Mexico to the Southern Andes. The highest concentration of them is found from oh, Venezuela to Peru through the Andes foothills and highlands. So their habitat tells us that most of them are cool growers and they're also good windowsill plants as they need just medium light to bloom as well as Deborah's is. <clears throat> Deborah's Cymbidium hybrid is growing and blooming beautifully outdoors at her home in San Francisco. The lip on this bronze beauty really steals the show. And this is Deborah's Kingianum type dendrobium. It doesn't have a tag, so it could be the species or a hybrid. Kingianums are from Australia, Queensland, and New South Wales, and they love our Bay Area climate. They need to be protected from the rain as they should receive much less water from Halloween until new growth appears in the spring. And I found that the flowers will last much longer, up to a month, if you withhold water while it's blooming. I know it's hard to not water, but toughen up. And Jeff Harris, our president with a J, shows us Lumboglossum cervantesii. It's also been known as Odontoglossum cervantesii, and currently it is Rincostelli cervantesii. Whatever you call it, it's beautiful. It has two inch kind of art deco looking flowers on a small mounted plant, the plant's under six inches. Jeff has it hanging from a pot with his Orangus biloba, which we saw last month. Um, Jeff got this Lumboglossum from Andes orchids a year or so ago, and this is his first bloom. It's a species from Mexico where it grows cool to cold in bright shade. This is Jeff's Paphiopetalum primulinum. This is a species from Northern Sumatra where it grows between 1300 and 1600 feet of elevation. So it's low elevation, it's a warm grower. It's a small lithophyte, meaning that it grows on rocks and it grows in hummus on the floor of dwarf forests on top of limestone hills. Just as the yellowest, um, almost con color form I've seen, and it's really beautifully symmetrical. The flower is about two and a half inches wide and many flowers bloom in succession on the same inflorescence for up to a year. This looks like it's probably the first bloom of a seedling plant that Jeff has. So nice job, Jeff. <clears throat> this is Jeff's Odontoglossum vanillia, Madison Heights, crossed with Nobile Monarch 4N. This is an unregistered hybrid. The parentage would tell us that it's a cool grower. It looks like Jeff is growing it in a basket outdoors. The burgundy brown spots on the white background are very pleasing and we can see distinct yellow keels or ridges in the lip, which are like a, a landing pad to draw the pollinator in to do its job. This is Gary Bard's Cattleya, which he says has an incorrect tag in it and he's asking for help to give it the correct name. Hopefully somebody else has it blooming right now and will recognize it. If you do, please send any information by a chat or directly to Gary. Gary's Lelio Cattleya Luminosa, which is a wonderful old cross registered in 1901 by Mr. Charles Worth. It's interesting that Gary knows the specific clones used in recreating this hybrid, including an aurea or yellow form of Cattleya Dawiana. It's the Dawiana which gives 
Luminosa, the spectac spectacular big lip here. Carrie obviously grows it high and bright in his greenhouse. This is Gary's Potanara Helping Hands, which he got from Santa Barbara Orchids. It's a complex hybrid, as you can see, and it's never been awarded in the US. It was registered in 1985 by Armacost. If you ever have a chance to go to a sale at Cal Orchids in Santa Barbara, it's right across the street from Santa Barbara Orchid Estate, which is usually open for those sale weekends. They're both great sources for all sorts of orchids. It's just a shopping extravaganza. It's where Jeff got this particular orchid. This is Gary's BLC Chia Lin New City. There are 24 awards internationally to BLC Chia Lin. 16 of them are to the clone New City. So Gary has a very special plant here. He purchased this from Carmela Orchids who's a Hawaiian grower and has often been a vendor at our POE. Tanya Lamb is in Tulsa tonight and she shows us Stella Mizotara Kelly. This is a hybrid genus with a big name, but the family tree is not as complex as it sounds. It has just three species in the background, Brassavola nodosa, Quotonia sanguinea, and Cattleya bicolor. And what an interesting result this is. The bubblegum colors here, are, I think they're really nicely contrasting. The notes on it indicate bright indirect light, intermediate to warm temperatures, so also a potential windowsill grower for you. This is Tanya's Epidendrum ciliari. Epidendrum is a large genus with more than 1,600 known species found throughout the top tropical Americas and the Caribbean. Ciliari is commonly known as the chicken feather orchid. Uh, because of the feathery lip that you see here. It is found in wet montane forests, high in trees, at elevations of only 500 to 1,000 meters as a large, medium-sized to large, warm-growing epiphyte, sometimes as a lithophyte on rocks. The inflorescences arise on a newly maturing pseudobulb, and the flowers are about three inches. They're fragrant with grapefruit to a kind of a floral scent. I think this blooming hits the applause meter for Tanya. Good job. <clears throat> Tanya's area, Vanoverbergii. I think this is a strikingly beautiful white species. It's from the Philippines, found at 1,000 to 5,000 feet. Mr. Vanoverberg was a Belgian plant collector who worked in the Philippines in the 1800s. The flowers are only about a half an inch. They have a crystalline, sparkly texture. Cynthia Hill had her large plant which we see on the right, awarded an HCC and the CCM Culture Award in, in 2010. It had 586 of these beautiful white flowers. And at that time, the genus was known as Mycoranthes. Cynthia's is shown at the right of Tanya's uh, beautiful photo here. This is Tanya's spectacularly bloomed Rincatlea Blue Ocean. This is a cross of Cattleya borrigiana by BLC Lois McNeil. The blue, this is what orchid is called blue. This blue color is really striking with a, this many flowers open at once. This is a, a wow. Susan Anderson shows us Jumelia major, found in Northern Madagascar in mossy montane forests, beside streams, um, on trunks and large tree branches at elevations of about 4,500 feet. So Susan grows in her intermediate greenhouse, which does not go below 58 degrees at night. The inflorescences arise from the base of the fans of leaves and they carry large, fresh, fleshy, night scented, about four inch flowers with a short spur, which tells us it's probably pollinated by a, a night moth. It's best, best grown potted in medium, medium to fine bark and given medium shade. There are no AOS awards on Jumelia Major. I think this needs a visit to the judging table, Susan. This is an applause worthy blooming. This is Susan Serrato stylus pristina. There are 147 species in the genus Serrato stylus. This miniature species is from the Philippines and it prefers low light, good humidity and plenty of water while it's growing gradually reducing as it grows mature, but never allow the plant to dry out completely. Susan Grocer is mounted on a piece of cork 
and this pristine flower is it's about a half of an inch. This is Susan's Rossio Blossom, Rod and Jester crossed with Rossio Blossom, Grande. The cross was registered in 2006 by Golden Gate Orchids, Tom Perlini, as Rossio Blossom, Bob Hamilton. These are big six inch showy flowers and Susan's plant has three inflorescences in bloom. It likes intermediate temperatures, medium light, so it could grow well in your house with good humidity and airflow. This is a spectacular showing. <clears throat> this is Henry Bell's first contribution to show and tell. Welcome, Henry. This is his Habanaria rhodochyla. There are approximately 760 species of Habanaria spread throughout the temperate and tropical grasslands of the world. The greatest concentration of species is in tropical South America, um, Asia, and Africa. They're deciduous and they die down after the flowering process, leaving just a fleshy tuber beneath the ground. When the plant is dormant, it needs little to no water, but as the new shoot appears, it's time to water and keep it wet until after the flowering has occurred again. The species Rhodochyla is found in Southeast Asia and the Philippines. It needs moderate shade, uh, cool to intermediate temperatures. The name uh, Rhodochyla means that it is the red-lipped habanaria, and about 90% of what we see here in these flowers is the lip. The very small sepals and petals are at the top, and also there's about a one-inch spur or nectary. These are not easy. So this is nicely grown, Henry. Henry's gastrochylus obliquus, obliquus um, meaning slanted or leaning, which somehow refers to the margins of the sepals and petals. There's 61 species of gastrochylus distributed so throughout Southeast Asia and the nearby islands. It's a monopodio short-stemmed orchid that grows epiphytically in trees. <clears throat> it likes moderate shade and high humidity. It likes to be on a wood mound or a slat basket with frequent watering in its growing season to give it a good, healthy plant. After blooming, much less water and fertilizer should be applied until new root growth is, is detected. In its habitat, the average winter nighttime temperatures are in the low 40s, so this is a cool grower. <clears throat> this is Henry's Dendrobium antonatum. The common name is the antelope orchid. It's a species found primarily in New Guinea in lowland swamps and coastal forests, mostly below 1,000 feet. So it's a warm grower and it needs moisture and humidity to be successful in cultivation and also dappled light. <clears throat> the flower is about an inch and a half wide by three inches tall, including the beautiful green antennae. Heidi Arno showed us, shows us Catacetum Kalo Sophia Atragracis Margolis by Catacetum Dark Odyssey. This is an unregistered Fred Clark Sunset Valley Orchids hybrid which Heidi acquired from Fred Clark in 2020. Catacetums are cool because they completely deciduate um, in the fall about now. And they want no water until the roots are about two inches long in the spring. You really have to withhold that water um, until the roots are about two inches long. They're also cool because unlike other orchids, they have separate male and female flowers. And the male flower has the ability to shoot its pollinia up to eight feet from the plant. This is very high speed sex, but that's enough said about that. This is Fred Anderson's Zygopetalum, which lost its tag. There are 14 species of zygos spread throughout Brazil, Paraguay, Argentina, uh, Bolivia, and Peru, where they grow epiphytically in trees in a humid, semi shady environment. Zygos are wonderful in any collection because they'll fill the room with sweet fragrance and they do beautifully grown on a windowsill in medium to bright and direct light or outdoors in the Bay Area. If your zygo is not blooming or spiking right now, it probably needs a little more light. Fred's is blooming nicely on two inflorescences. <clears throat> Jan Anderson shows us Speclinia tribuloides, which she says she collected in Belize in 2005. The common name is a lobster claw orchid because of the flower shape and color. It's found from Mexico to Brazil, very humid rainforest and cloud forest. So it likes warm to hot temperatures and does well mounted or potted as Jan shows us here in a well draining medium. <clears throat> it prefers year round water, moderate to heavy shade, 
the tiny flowers are only about a quarter of an inch, but they stay in bloom for a long period. This is unique and adorable, Jan. <clears throat> Jan's Catlea decori, which um, now appears to be Gorianthi skinneri. Jan knew Paul and Jane Brecht, who ran an orchid shop in Costa Mesa. A substantial part of the business involved orchid boarding for the wealthy people in Newport Beach in the coastal cities in the 1980s. And Jan says she volunteered time at the Costa Mesa Senior Center one afternoon a month. She would go before lunch to Breck's shop to go in the back and look at all the wonderful things in bloom in the boarding area. Jan had only a few orchids at the time and she would fantasize about the ones she would like to grow one day. So here she is with this beautiful Catlea decori Brex, which was awarded a CCM Culture Award to Paul Brecht in 1977. Oops, sorry. Vincent, Vincent Pietro Martir shows this BLC Bouton d'Or Halcyon, which has an AMAOS, and is crossed with BLC, guess what? SVO3. He purchased this beauty from Tiny Jungle in February 2021 and grows it indoors on a windowsill. The plant's about 12 inches tall and it looks like this is a first bloom seedling. The single flower is three inches across and Vincent is hoping for more flowers next blooming. The fall colors and the lip of this complex hybrid I think are really striking. Vincent's Cymbidium tracianum, which um, we talked about earlier. He grows this outdoors and he says it was given to him by a friend years ago. And it's the only cymbidium he has growing in soil rather than in bark. And it is also generally the first of his cymbidiums to bloom in the winter. This year it did not disappoint. It has a spike with seven flowers, each about five inches across. It's generally fragrant about two to three days after the flowers have opened. Tracy Anum is a species found in China, Laos, Vietnam. It elevations up to about 7,000 feet. It grows in trees and on rocks in damp shaded forests, often overhanging streams. So that tells us, gives us some good clues about how to grow it in cultivation. Vincent's is a beautifully dark form of Tracyanum. And Tracyanum is, a, I think, is a great addition to any collection. <clears throat> K. Klum shows us Dendrocolin Kopfii. Kopfii is named for a German nurseryman, Kopf and first described in 2011. So it's uncommon in collections at this point. It's endemic to Mindanao in the Philippines where it grows as a medium-sized cool growing epiphyte. Each flower is less than a quarter of an inch, but it has about 50 flowers emerging in two ranks along the inflorescence. <clears throat> this is a spectacular blooming of case Mysticidium venosum. We don't need a ruler to see how tiny this plant is because it's growing on champagne corks. Um, it grows in the intermediate greenhouse for K. Mysticidiums are generally thought of as leafless orchids, which photosynthesize through their roots, but they do get the occasional leaf as we can see in the right-hand photo here from K. This is a species from South Africa. It grows in the intermediate green, greenhouse. And this one, I think it's the applause meter. It has eight flower spikes and over 50 flowers. Lovely. Kay purchased this plant labeled Catlea crispa. It has since been tentatively identified as Perseveliana, but it's still open to correction. Uh, Ron, if you have any input on this, we'd be interested. This grows in the intermediate greenhouse where she's running out of room. So Kay says she's willing to trade it. Just make her an offer please via chat or via email directly to Kay. Glenn Finch shows us Brachypeza or Pterocerus semi-teritifolium. The Q monocot list accepts them as synonyms. <clears throat> this species was first described in 2014, found around Dalat, Vietnam, where it grows in evergreen forests at elevations of just 1,000 to 1,500 meters. And it will take a wide range of temperatures, but it prefers cool and it likes bright diffuse light. Glenn says he purchased this fragrant miniature from Andes. It is a charmer and beautifully grown Glenn. Glenn's Selogeny Messengiana, which is a, a lithophyte, grows on rocks native to Guatemala and Belize. It grows on rocky cliffs above streams and in a humid atmosphere. 
Glenn purchased this from Susan Anderson through Sonoma County's spring online plant sale. It has three spikes with 53 flowers. So this hits the applause meter too. Glenn's Catlea Calisto Glossa. This is a primary hybrid of just two species, Lelio purpurata by Catlea wars of Ixii semi-alba. This is a seedling Glenn purchased about three years ago from Cal Orchid in Santa Barbara. And this is his first blooming with three flowers, which he says are nicely fragrant. It needs bright indirect light to bloom this well at immediate to warm temperatures, generally not below 50, 58 at night. It should dry out by between waterings, a good window so candidate. <clears throat> this is my Lelia autoceps, which is a primary hybrid between just two species, Lelia anceps and Lelia autumnalis. The cross was registered in 1925, but it's never been awarded, probably because the offspring that we see here is not an improvement on the two parents, which is kind of a, a rule of thumb for quality awards. The hybrid should show some unique or special characteristic. I bought this as a small seedling, seedling from Sunset Valley Orchids in 2019. This is its first blooming. And what I like is that the plant is smaller and more compact than its parents. And the inflorescence is also not as long. I grow this in my cool greenhouse down to 42 at night. <clears throat> this is Dendrobium hookerianum, a species found in China and Nepal up to 6,500 feet. So it's fairly high elevation. I grow it in my cool greenhouse, night temperatures down to 42 Fahrenheit, and it's in bright indirect light. It was discovered in the early 1900s, but is not often seen in collections for some reason. This plant came from Dan Newman on a um, SFOS raffle table, table in 2019. This is the first time it's bloomed for me. I love the hairy lip fringes, which Ron, I know you would love as well. This is my Celia Bella, which I bought in 2016 from Mary Nisbet of California Orchids and Bellinas, and which a week ago received to my delight an AM Quality Award and a CCM Cultural Award. Um, I was thrilled. I give my awarded plants the clonal name Bonheur, which means happiness in French. I used to be a French teacher, and Bonheur is also, was also my pet rabbit's name, Bonheur. It's a lithophytic species found from Belize, uh, Mexico, Honduras. So I grow it in lava rock because it hates to have its roots, roots disturbed and the lava rock does not break down or need to be replaced. It had 110 flowers and 25 buds on 27 inflorescences when it was awarded. And these are Ramon's award photos. Happy face for me here. And now onto the pet parade. <clears throat> This is Chani Langland's gorgeous kitty Zorro, admiring her Miltonia spectabilis and what a beauty the orchid is too. So Tyler Albrecht was getting ready to photograph his Ancostelli bittersweet, which we saw earlier. And along came Lucy, <clears throat> the eight year old German short hair pointer to see if it might smell good. If Lucy was interested, Kara, the two and a half year old golden retriever, didn't want to miss out on something that might smell good and be edible. And then Chips, the one year old Springer Spaniel, monkey see, monkey do. Tyler says the flowers have no aroma that he can detect, but the dogs obviously do and they like it. Pretty cute. So that's it for show and tell for tonight. And some of my research material. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you for the wonderful photos. Stay well and happy growing. Um, okay. Can folks hear me now? Thank you, Lynn. That was wonderful as always. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. <laughs> folks, don't forget to uh, send us your Instagram handles if, by email so we can, um, or, or, uh, I think in the chat, we might be able to pick them up. Better, better by email, <laughs> make it a record. Um, so we're gonna split things up now. So for the people on Zoom, Corey is gonna do um, the raffle for gift certificates from Tiny Jungle and Sunset Valley. And then we'll shut down the Zoom. And then we're gonna, in the room, we're gonna do the um, White Elephant Gift Exchange 
and set up while we set up for the uh, the opportunity table, and then we'll clean up and be out of here hopefully by before ten. <laughs> what time is it? Yeah, we're doing good. So hang in there. Uh, we'll need some help cleaning up in the end. So we'll ask people to help us put everything away. We have to all volunteer. <laughs> um, we'll uh, so we'll do that now. So I'm going to hand it off to Corey online, and then. Um, Corey, do you let me know when you want us to shut down the Zoom? Uh, can you hear me, Corey? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. I'm looking at the chats. So the folks that Corey, we seem to have lost the sound on Zoom. Hi, Lane, can you hear me? And now, yes, thank you. I am in the chat. So if you are on Zoom and you haven't seen your chat window, I'm asking for anyone who's interested in a gift certificate to send me a message or just send it to the whole chat, um, whether you want SVO, Tiny Jungle or either is okay with you. And I'm just taking everyone's names down and I'll send an email to the winners. If you're not sure how to do that, if you just hover over the bottom of your Zoom window, a little icon should come up that says chat. If you're on the phone, just tap the screen and hit more, and there is a option to chat. So I'm just gonna be quiet unless someone has questions, but I am just taking down names furiously that everyone is typing to me. Okay. Anyone's having trouble getting their name in the chat, you can speak up and let me know and I'll help you out or just say, I'm interested, just unmute yourself and let me know. Uh-oh. Can you all hear me? Yes. Can anyone besides Lynn hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I can hear you. Yeah. Someone can't. I'm so sorry. Oh, Carolyn. Okay. Great. I got you, Carolyn. I don't know if you can hear me or not. All 
Okay, I'm gonna give you all like another few minutes to let me know if you're interested. And then we will shut down the meeting for Zoom. All right, I got Carolyn Fisher, Winnie Wang, Tanya Lam, Eric Rice, Reese, sorry, Jennifer Chungafung. Love the uh, handle there, Lisa Perla, Jan Anderson, Vincent, I got you, Glenn Finch, the Rathbuns, Carolyn Fisher, host of different Carolyn. Uh, who else do I got? You should have Ken. Say that again, sorry. Kay, it was like, Kay, I, ha I have you. I haven't gotten your name yet. Um,